It is recording. So everybody, welcome to this lecture. I am extremely enthusiastic uh, to be able to, um, to uh, invite uh, Dr. Fedler to, uh, to present on veteran homelessness. It's a subject uh, that is very close to uh, my heart and to so many people's heart too, uh, but she will explain all these details. Um, but uh, I would like just to uh, introduce you actually to that class for the people who uh, don't belong to this class. Um, every Tuesday night during uh, the uh, either fall or winter, uh, during a semester, we offer a webinar we call uh, on uh, issues in military veteran and family health. Um, and every uh, evening, uh, Tuesday, there's a, a, a new lecturer coming with uh, different backgrounds. Uh, we have people from across Canada, but also international, um, extremely lucky. And uh, Dr. Fedder accepted today uh, to do a public lecture so we could open it to more people and, uh, and um, take advantage of her incredible knowledge in, in this field and so many other fields. So, um, and Dr. Tamsito is a uh, is teaching that is, is a, a professor for that course, and uh, and I will let her introduce because truly this course belongs to her. So I will let her introduce uh, Dr. Fedley. Thank you, Dr. Belanger. Um, welcome to uh, the class. Um, I see many of you here, and welcome to those of you who are um, joining from the Simber community. Um, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you this evening Dr. Stephanie Felder. Uh, she's a commander in the U.S. Public Health Service Commissioned Corps. She serves as the chief uh, licensed clinical social worker within the Office of the Secretary, Office of the Assistant Secretary, Office of the Surgeon General Commission's Corps, Headquarters Public Health Emergency Response Strike Team, or FIRST. As a first clinical social worker, she provides rapid response to regional, national, and global public health emergencies, and when not deployed, she uses her high-level clinical skills to fill critical public health needs in locations such as rural, remote, and underserved communities, including Indian Health Services, Bureau of Prisons, and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and we were just talking about her most recent deployment up to Alaska. Earlier, she served as the Chief of Traumatic Brain Injury Outcomes for the Defense Health Agency Research and Development, Trauma Brain, Traumatic Brain Injury Center of Excellence. In this role, uh, Dr. Felder provided oversight of traumatic brain injury outcomes for the uh, 450,000 American Armed Forces active duty personnel and veterans and families impacted by traumatic brain injury. Dr. Felder has spent nearly 10 years in the U.S. Public Health Service providing program management, technical assistance, research evaluation, and data analysis within several agencies of the Department of Health and Human Services. Her experiences include oversight of grants for HIV AIDS services for medically underserved patients, technical assistance for communities experiencing natural disasters, and supervision of clinical standards and quality for hospice and home health agencies. Dr. Felder is the board director for the American Board of Clinical Social Work and serves as chair of membership. She also serves as the director of continuing education for the ABC SW. Dr. Felder is an adjunct faculty member at Tulane University where she teaches research and leadership courses. And prior to active duty, Dr. Felder served as the health care for homeless veteran coordinator um, for the Fayetteville Veterans Affairs um, and Medical Center in North Carolina. As a national representative of female veterans experiencing homelessness, she advocated for their unique needs. She received a full academic scholarship from the Catholic University of America and completed a doctoral degree in social work, which focused on homelessness among female veterans. And she has a remarkable 15 year record of advocacy efforts focused on homelessness, female veterans, emergency management, mental illness, HIV AIDS and economically um, oppressed communities. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Felder to our um, discussion today and feel free uh, to post uh, comments or questions in the chat. Um, they will be moderated. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much, Dr. Temsito, for that uh, introduction. In 2017, I was deployed on a mission to respond to a natural disaster. A Category 4 hurricane had ravaged a small community, and we were sent there to provide support to the locals. One of my fellow officers made a comment that I never forgot. He said, 
the uniform is about service, about diminishing the I for the we, about earning an identity that is above and beyond self. One of many and the many become one. Honor those who went before and establish honor for those to come. As each one dons the uniform and grows into its tradition and meaning, the uniform has a voice. It speaks without words in a visual language. By wearing the uniform, I felt compelled to research and advocate for those that came before me and became homeless veterans. As a social worker, I worked for the Department of Veteran Affairs and I saw firsthand the plight of homeless veterans and homeless female veterans. At that time, as a relatively <laughs> new social worker, when offered the position to work for the VA, I assumed that I would be working with men. I never even considered that I, worked, that I would work with women and children. But within a few days of accepting the position as the healthcare for homeless veteran coordinator, I witnessed a female veteran and her children walk through the doors in need of housing. As I continued to work with the VA and within the homeless program, I met other women and children also experiencing homelessness. I assisted in securing permanent housing for many veterans, but one story that I am reminded of is a female veteran that lost her child due to the restricted conditions of living in a hotel with multiple children. I will always remember her request for help after her infant died due to the conditions of the hotel. The infant actually rolled off the bed into a bag filled with their belongings. This is a serious problem that we must address. Before I go any further, I wanna say thank you to Simber, to Dr. Tamsito and the students for allowing me to be here to share my research and to talk about a topic that is very important to me. Homeless, homelessness among our nation's veterans in Canada and in the United States. I also have a few thank yous. I would also like to thank and acknowledge several people for their assistance. Alona Wolf for helping develop the slide deck because she allows me to be able to, on my downtime, do presentations like this because we're very busy, especially with all that's happening in the world right now. So we're really busy in the Office of the Surgeon General. Also, Mr. Ennett Bryant, he's an Army veteran with 24 years of service who came to work alongside me at the Fayetteville VA in 2011, and he encouraged me to pursue more, to get a doctorate, and to continue to serve in other ways. Also, last but not least, Ms. Doris Moore Russell, she is a retired Air Force veteran. She served 10 and a half years on active duty two years in the Air Force Reserves, and six in Air Force inactive reserves. And she worked for the VA serving veterans for 21 years. She served as the Associate Chief at Fayetteville VA Medical Center in North Carolina, and she continues to serve others until this very day. She is a licensed clinical social worker, just like me. Uh, she has a private practice and is currently working on her Master's in Divinity. I met her in 2011 when she hired me and gave me a start as something that would become a lifelong passion, advocating for homeless veterans and helping them to tell their stories. As you can see, I have great mentors and a great deal of inspiration and support. I too now wear the uniform, so I owe a debt to those who came before me and to honor them. Upon accepting commission as a United States Public Health Service Commission Corps Officer I fully realized the importance of service and assisting other active duty personnel and our veterans. This July will make 10 years that I've had the honor of wearing this uniform. I will now continue with the presentation. We will talk about the social policies and systemic issues contributing to veteran homelessness. So we have several learning objectives and you will hear me talk about Canada and then also the United States with a primary focus on the following. 
understanding individuals, families, and veterans who experience homelessness, review of a few social policies that contribute and potentially address homelessness as well, examine federal and local resources to prevent and address homelessness, and talk about the complex service needs. And here are some examples from my research with homeless female veterans, and then ultimately formulate strategies to prevent homelessness. So uh, I, when I initially developed the course, it was for students. And so now I know there's uh, others in here as well, but I think the questions, the discussion questions, and even the essay assignment, while you have to write it and turn it in, I think it is definitely worth uh, pondering for all of us here today. Because if you're here, that means you care about this, this topic. So the essay assignment was the solution to the problem of homelessness among Canadian veterans. And I know that is a, a tall order. Students should come up with their own solution to the problem. Once the student has created a solution, the essay should be drafted to the audience of their choice. And as you're working on that, think about um, who would be in that audience. It could be a homeless veteran. It could be their families. Maybe it's policymakers. Uh, the Canadian VA or any other external stakeholder. So you would use the opening statement. It has come to my attention that homelessness has become a great concern in our society. As an individual who is greatly concerned about the future of our veterans and homelessness, I ask you to please accept the following recommendations to eradicate homelessness. And feel free to expand on policies that we talk about here today to uh, make recommendations for changes in those policies or even be innovative and creative and develop your own solution. Also in that process, think about some of the special interest groups, uh, whether that's women with children, pregnant women, uh, people needing assistance with substance use or things like that. Here are the course readings for today. And then optional readings. If you didn't get a chance to take a look at those, it'll be fine because we're gonna talk a lot about uh, some demographics and between Canada and the United States. But at the end, we'll have uh, a chance for some open discussion as well. Here are the other discussion questions to consider what factors contribute to Canadian veterans experiencing homelessness? What are those factors? What are those risk factors? Why is it important to understand the difference between male and female veteran homelessness? And what are the specific needs of female veterans experiencing homelessness? Why is homelessness among veterans a public health issue? And what federal and local policies are in place that can help prevent and address homelessness among our veterans? So I'm going to start with a breakdown of the Canadian military. So your military force is a bit leaner than the United States. The armed forces is increasing, and you may already be to this point, to 72K in the regular force and about 30K in the reserve force, with a little over 5,000 Ranger patrols. Um, you serve by air, land, and sea, which is very, very similar to our Air Force, our Army, and Navy, and one and seven are women. And you can see some other uh, demographics here on the slide. Now we're gonna talk about growth of women in the Canadian military. And all of this, um, as I go through, it'll be similar when I talk about the US side, but I'm trying to provide a context of the background as we move into thinking about the military the military structure, women in the military, and then we'll move into homelessness and then we'll have to tie it all back together. So similar to our force in the United States, women have been serving since 1885. Initially, women only served as nurses. It was the only role that was available to them in the First World War. And they provided medical care near and far from the front lines. So they were still basically in danger because in any of those positions, um, you'll, you'll be in direct contact with combat. In the Second World War, there was the creation of women's service branches, the Women's 
Army Corps, the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service. Um, and there was one more that I'm missing here, but it was three, it was three different uh, branches created. These women took on many of the non-combat duties, allowing many of the men to go focus on the combat duties. These branches were eventually dissolved in 1968, and then women and men would serve in the same units. By the end of the 1980s, women were permitted to serve in nearly all military occupations, and the last gender-based occupation restriction ended in 2001, when the submarine service was open to women. Despite these advances, women continue to face other obstacles, uh, obstacles such as uh, the growing awareness of sexual violence and military sexual trauma, which affects women disproportionately. Now we're gonna move into the demographics of Canada's homeless in general. So homeless is, homelessness is also widespread in Canada as approximately 235,000 homeless people um, are, exist in Canada any given year. And as we go through the numbers, just kind of in your mind, keep those numbers um, as we talk about general population of homelessness, and then we go down to look at the homelessness among the veterans. So Canada's veterans numbers, homeless numbers are relatively small compared to the United States. And you'll see that when I get to those slides. Around 3,000 to 5,000 are the numbers that I've seen in, in multiple articles. So it seems like you all are falling somewhere between that range. But the point is, while it may be um, smaller than the United States, if there is one homeless veteran, it is still one homeless veteran too many. So even having 3,000 to 5,000 is still too many homeless veterans. Uh, there was a statement that uh, we hear a lot in the U.S. is that the words homeless and veteran should never be used in the same sentence. And I think this would apply here as well. So risk factors for military homelessness in Canada and the United States. And this is probably the only slide where you will see that I don't break out Canada from the United States. And the reason why is because the risk factors are very much the same. We're looking at substance abuse and mental health needs, the co complex service needs, difficulty transitioning from military status to veteran status, lack of affordable housing and living uh, and livable income, and lack of family and social support networks. And as I go through, you'll see as we talk about this, you'll see why these risk factors are common across both Canada and the United States. So now we're gonna move on to a bit of a, a focus on the United States. So the United States adopted an all volunteer force uh, during the Vietnam War in 1973 in response to many of the protests. So now, we have a little over 1.3 million service members with the army being the largest, um, followed by typically the Navy and the Air Force. You can see they're kind of uh, competing there and then the Marine Corps. And then we have the Coast Guard. What you don't see in this um, picture is the United States Public Health Service, which I am a part of because we are not considered um, combat troops. We're not considered um, armed forces because our focus is on public health. And while we will work directly beside the DOD and the armed forces, our mission is to protect, promote, and advance the health and safety of the nation. So many times you won't see us included in these numbers, although we are a uniformed service, but we're not um, armed force. So here's some demographics of the US military. So you can kind of um, get an idea of the breakout. The blue, um, the blue lines represent the women, the enlisted women, and then the black, the active duty enlisted men. So you can see a bit of a breakout here. 
I'm going to use the pen. Here we go. So you can see a bit of a breakout here as you go um, as far as white and the numbers, which is it's not you know too far. And the same thing with black. And you can also see our other ethnicities um, that are represented in the enlisted portion of the US military, which this is important um, as we talk about uh, some of the issues that occur in the military. And you'll hear me speak more to race and ethnicity uh, as I talk about some of my research. So growth of women in the United States military. Women continue to be one of the fastest growing groups in the United States military. Currently, uh, we represent 16% of the enlisted and 19% of officers. Also in 2013, we saw the lift of the combat ban, which many women were really excited about that because as I said earlier, you know, serving on, um, if you're serving on the, the front lines providing medical care, or even if you're somewhat back away from it, or you're doing transportation, you're still in the midst of everything that is happening. And so many of the women veterans that I spoke with said they were really excited that this, this ban was gone because they were already in, you know, seeing a lot of action. And it was almost like something that was preventing them from being able to advance in their careers because they were already seeing the action. They were getting hurt. They were in transportation units and, you know, hitting IEDs and things like that, but they couldn't actually assume that role. So you can kind of see a bit of a parallel as well when you look at the historical um, changes from Canada and also as you watch the historical changes with women in the United States with 1948 being that, that critical year of when you see women receiving some um, more authorization from President Truman along with um, Blacks as well because of the desegregation of the military at that time. So if you look at the timelines, there's a lot of similarities happening near, close to near the same time points. This is also, it's another depiction of the growth of, um, of enlisted women in the United States military. And as you can see, the different branches are represented here. And you can see how much of a change that there's been across the different branches. And this goes until 2015. So this continues through, um, yes, through 2015. So this continues to increase. Also another representation to give you an idea of um, officers and enlisted as well across the branches. And sometimes when we, uh, when we, kind of focus in, we think a lot about the enlisted, but um, we also have our officers and they, they take up a nice chunk of the numbers as well. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the demographics, demographics of United States homelessness. And so here I'll add in a little information about our policies. So I'll try to summarize um, policy across the, the U.S. over the years. So traditionally, the issue of homelessness was seen as a private problem. It was a personal issue. Um, in 1980s, uh, the problem became more of a national issue. And in response to that, the Reagan administration actually created a federal task force in 1983 to help localities identify surplus federal property, which would be used for homelessness. But at the same time, the social services was reduced by nearly 78%. So they saw the budget for social services go from 32 billion to about 6.9 billion in 1989. So as you could probably uh, guess, by the mid 1980s, the country was in full agreement across parties that there was a need to address all of the homeless camps that they were starting to see pop up across the communities. So in 1986, the mckinney Vento Act uh, went forward and it did a few things. It was 15 programs and it ranged from emergency shelters to transitional housing, 
job training, primary health care, education, and it also included some permanent housing. That uh, legislation basically paved the way for the other legislation that would come. And in 2009, we had the Hearth Act, which was the Homeless Emergency Assistance and Rapid Transition to Housing Act. And it provided um, other recommendations, but one of the bigger recommendations is that it formed the United States Interagency Council on, the homeless, on Homelessness. And that council wrote the first federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. And, and it also included many of the agencies, um, administrations, and the VA was one of those administrations that sat on this board. And from there, things um, it started to really go in the right direction. Uh, the VA secretary was Eric Shinsheki, and he decided that at that point, enough was enough, and that he was going to focus on ending homelessness among all veterans. And that's where it all started. So as you can see, the United States, has, we've done a really good job as far as decreasing um, with the amount of homelessness in general. And then we're also gonna go into um, talking about veterans. So you can see the dark blue line here shows you your veterans, but you can see families here um, unsheltered. And now we're starting to peak a little bit. The peak started around 2020 and that could be COVID. It could be uh, many other things kind of explaining, but. Um, there was definitely a decrease across homelessness in general. And I'll get to a slide that will focus in on um, homeless veterans, but you can see that there was a decrease over the years and a uh, concerted effort to, to make this decrease and a, a strong focus on the veterans, which you see here. Um, I was working at the VA in 2011, and that was a time when we talked about homeless veterans we the numbers was always over a hundred thousand to actually see thirty seven thousand at this point and it's still kind of decreasing it's around thirty seven and you see thirty five um, is definitely great progress. However, as I said earlier, when I mentioned the three thousand to five thousand, if you have one, it's still one too many. So there has to be um, a continued focus on how to make sure that all of our veterans um, are housed, are stably housed. So now I'm gonna show a brief video on um, the look at the effort to address homelessness among um, our veterans here in the United States. So hopefully this will play. No, I'll watch it in the, my room. I forgot to get scheduled into something. Life is still, life is still, but you don't, but you don't, but many people don't. Introducing EarLens, a revolutionary new hearing technology. EarLens is different because EarLens uses a tiny custom fit lens to gently vibrate the eardrum, giving you two and a half times the band. Thousands of American hearing serves and sacrifices the less your technology and dramatically better speech understanding. The day that I found out about your lens, it just changed everything for me. It really was the answer that I was seeking. Okay, sorry about that. Hopefully, it is an intricate problem. Our leaders have repeatedly, thousands of Americans who've served and sacrificed in the U.S. military are now living without permanent homes in this country. It is an intricate problem. Our leaders have repeatedly promised to fix. But could a solution finally be on the horizon? Tonight, our exclusive one-on-one -on -one with VA Secretary Dennis McDonough on an ambitious project that's now underway, just steps from one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in America, and why it could be a model for ending veteran homelessness once and for all. Here's our Devin Dwyer. Here's a phrase that should not exist, homeless vet. For Dennis McDonough, like generations of VA secretaries before him, homelessness among military veterans is a confounding stain on America's promise. American people expect that they're not be homeless veterans. The bigger problem for us is going to be 
if we fail, which is why I'm not going to let us fail. While the number of homeless vets has dropped by more than half over the last decade, an estimated 20,000 U.S. vets still lack permanent homes. Dozens of homeless veterans had been living on these sidewalks on VA's doorstep just a few months ago, but they've been moved onto the property where they have access to showers, meals, and security. We saw firsthand last month in Los Angeles, home to the largest population of homeless vets in the country, how McDonough's VA is trying to accelerate progress. Feel safer over there tomorrow? Over here, no doubt. The encampment on the West LA VA campus is both beautiful and baffling. Veterans living in the shadow of buildings originally constructed to house and help them after World War II. Some have been sitting idle for decades. These old buildings are just down the road from Beverly Hills. They're turning them into housing for veterans on a sprawling 388-acre campus that will be the largest veterans housing project in America. The vision is ambitious, an estimated billion-dollar public-private partnership to transform some of the VA's most valuable real estate into a campus of 1,200 new apartment homes that could house more than a quarter of the city's homeless vets. The no doubt an emphatic answer to an intractable problem. Money. Steve Peck, a Vietnam combat vet and president of the nation's largest nonprofit serving at risk veterans, is the lead developer. Building behind us uh, will be 60 units for senior veterans. The building across the street will be the service center. So you're up to prove that solving the homeless problem veterans is more than building a house. Oh, absolutely. Combining all of the housing and services in one place uh, really gives veterans every opportunity to succeed. There will be a town center, community kitchen, art and athletic spaces, a therapeutic garden, and easy access to VA medical care. Community Director Tess Banco, a Marine veteran survivor of military sexual trauma, calls the integration of resources unprecedented and monumental. I see your smile. <laughs> Absolutely inspiring. Every time I, I stand in that building and knowing what is happening and what's going to happen at this campus, uh, it's energizing. But over six years since the plan was first approved, just 5% of veteran apartments on the West LAVA campus have been completed. One independent audit faulting a lack of accountability and lack of urgency. And if a private developer wants to buy a parcel and put up an apartment building, it wouldn't take them five years. Uh, it, it is a funding problem. The water, the sewer, the electricity, the, the telecom, all that has to be redone. And where is that money going to come from? Peck says developers have raised only a tenth of the total price tag and also need help cutting red tape. When the top dog says, let's get it done, then people below find a way to get it done. Yeah, we're going to cut through all the red tape we can, some, some of it we can't. Part of the balancing act are things that are required by law. It doesn't have a target date for completion. No. Why is that? But if I start to go through the reasons, what I'll do is it sound like excuses. We'll get to a bigger number here over the course of this year upwards of uh, almost 200 additional units. He says that will build confidence in the project, enticing Congress, the state, and private sector to cut checks to keep it going. And you can see the amount of light in, in this room. This is a common area. We saw for ourselves that dozens of units are nearly ready to become homes, but many advocates told us the 10-year or longer timeline to finish the campus is unacceptable. I know that sometimes I felt forgotten. Nicholas Cormier is a former Air Force air traffic controller and former resident of Building 257 after he lost his job and couldn't pay rent. This is a humanitarian crisis. It's a war zone. It's, you know what I mean? This is how I see addressing the problem is it's boots on the ground every single day. Joyce Campbell, a Navy veteran who had a good paying job and a home until COVID cost her both, turned to the VA for temporary housing to help her reset. It's allowed me to settle down my emotional state, you know, and get uh, comfortable in looking forward as opposed to continually watching my back. The potential to make a big dent in homelessness among vets has won the West LAVA project a small army of backers. Former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, retired Admiral Mike Mullen, is a top fundraiser. This could be a model for many VA centers across the country. It seems to me it requires a lot of pressure points to get it moving along. I've been involved in this project with four secretaries, for example. So it, be, it becomes very difficult to 
hold them accountable. I would love to see Congress much more involved. We work for the Department of Veterans Affairs. McDonough is trying to keep his focus on the lived experience of Vets Without a Home. We joined him last month to participate in an annual nationwide count of America's homeless in cities coast to coast. He told us being on the streets has given him renewed urgency. And I'll tell you what, walking around uh, in some tough neighborhoods on as cold a night as we've had in D.C. is a good reminder of just how difficult it is to be homeless. I've been very clear that I should be held to account for this. You, you think you're going to buck stops with you? What remains is elbow grease, and we're going to apply the elbow grease, and if it's not applied, then it's my problem. Our thanks to Devin for that. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> so yes, that was a short clip um, showing our current situation as we're still trying to address um, the, the remaining numbers of homeless veterans. And as you can see, it continues to be a conversation that is at the, the forefront that people want to see something done about. The other part of that is many of the veterans that are left, the ones that are not housed, um, they could have some serious mental health, substance abuse issues. And so um, it, it becomes a bit more complex when you start talking about how to address um, that issue. But one of the things that you will see, we'll talk more about later in the presentation is housing first and the way housing first can be used to address it. Um, in some cases, and I've, I have personal experience with this as well, and even using the, the housing first model, if the, the case management, the wraparound services aren't really complete, um, then the veteran can still eventually lose the housing and become homeless again. So they, they start to kind of go in a circle and a cycle uh, in the homeless process. And, and then the VA is brought into that and they're trying to figure out how to best address that. But we'll talk about more. We'll talk about that more. Um, now I'm going to move into some um, an overview of uh, the research that I did, the life course of homeless female veterans, a qualitative study. And at the end of the video, um, you heard the secretary speak about the lived experience. And that was the, the focus um, of this research to capture the lived experience of uh, the female veterans that were experiencing homelessness. In the United States, we have, the research is starting to definitely pick up um, when I was doing the study in the around 2016, I didn't see as many articles with the focus on female veterans. Um, as you can see in our in my previous slide, our numbers for homeless veterans was steadily decreasing. However, a number of female veterans was actually increasing. So while the whole was going down, the special interest group of women were actually going up. And so that is why I tailored my focus on female veterans. And then also from my experience at the Fayetteville VA, and I also worked at the Durham VA and seeing how many women and children, uh, female veterans um, experienced this issue. And so the research question, how do life events during childhood, adolescence, young adulthood, adulthood, military service, and the transition from military service to veteran status influence a woman's pathway into homelessness? So that is a, a very broad uh, question, um, but we wanted to keep that question broad so we could really, we walked in with the assumption of, although we've read all of the research articles and the many, many quantitative articles, we wanted to step back and say, tell us your story. And so we can present that. Um, and we're assuming that we don't know anything in this process. We want you to tell us what happened and, um, and just really share your story. And so that's how we how we approach the, the research design. So for this study, it was approved by the IRB at Catholic University of America. And we wanted to have limited criteria because we definitely wanted to get female veterans interested in the study. So any female veteran that experienced homelessness or that was currently homeless, 
had at least two years of armed forces services and was at least 18 or older was eligible for the study. The data collection process involved two separate interviews over the course of two to three days, each about 90 minute long. I would say, I will say that some of the veterans, um, they said they, you know, I, I said it, it only had to be 90 minutes long. We, we didn't have to go past that, that point. But many of them said that it was the first time that they were telling their stories. So they knew that they would go over 90 minutes. And so, of course, I honored that and allowed them to share that story the way they needed to. In the first meeting, it was more administrative. We did the informed consent. We I took uh, demographics and then we did a life history grid. And the life history grid essentially was a timeline so we could have a chronological ordering of things that happened across their lives. So, and, and I focused in on key domains like health, uh, relationships, family, religion, things like that. In the second interview, I use a semi-structured interview guide with questions such as the following. Can you tell me about your childhood? Can you tell me about your military experience? Can you tell me about your homeless experience? So questions like that. And then we took that life history grid and we kept it in front of us. So as they went through those questions from childhood to adolescence, they had that life history grid to say, okay, yeah, it was during this time that this major life event occurred, or it was at this point where I went to the military. And when I left the military, things started to fall apart. So they had that that chronological timeline to kind of help guide them as we went through that semi-structured uh, interview. Another thing I did was I had the questions that I asked um, reviewed by two social workers and uh, each had over 15 years of experience in working with homeless vets for content validity asking them, are these reasonable questions? You've worked with this population for longer than I have. Can you give me some feedback? So that was also very helpful. I was able to conduct um, two of the interviews occurred in Maryland and one happened in DC and 11 occurred in Atlanta, Georgia, which was really interesting because um, I sent the information out um, on social media and also it was like uh, some word of mouth when people saw it. So for a social worker, actually a social worker that I don't know, um, place my flyer and you'll see the flyer coming up in a, um, in a housing facility as a transitional housing facility where in Atlanta, where female veterans were living. And so it was on the board and they saw it and they started to call. So that's why many of my participants came from the Atlanta, Georgia area. So I would fly down there to meet with them. So as far as the data collection process, um, as I said, two interviews per participant, the informed consent, um, demographic questions, life history grid, and the semi-structured interview guide. So through the use of, and it was always face-to-face, -face, this was pre-COVID, so I was able to, you know, actually fly there and um, work really hard on building an instant rapport so they could feel comfortable sharing the things that they would share. Uh, so through the use of these face-to-face -face interviews, 14 female veterans who experienced homelessness, homelessness share their stories across the phases of their lives. Um, it was... And, and you'll see the quotes. I mean, it was it was it was raw. It was um, for some of them. They said it felt like you know a burden was lifted because finally they could share that story. And then for many of them, they said that uh, you know I was forgotten. And so to see that someone actually wanted just to hear my story, um, it, it was really uplifting for them. So some of the participant uh, demographics. So participants range, they ranged in ages from 32 to 62. So I had a very widespread, five participants were in their 30s, two were in their 40s, four were in their 50s, and three were in their 60s. Uh, there was also a really wide range in the, the time served in the military. And when I say a wide range, I'm from two years 
up to 34 years. So I had a, a nice span there. Um, 13, this was this was interesting. 13 of the women were African American and one was Caucasian, which typically in the United States, we have uh, difficulty um, being able to have minorities and you know, African American men or women uh, participate in research studies. So that was, uh, it was definitely um, unexpected, but I received some really good information from there. So it also doubles as a limitation in the study as well, but um, still gathers some really good information. There were five divorced participants, three married participants, three participants who were single and never married, and two who were separated, and then uh, one widow. And she was actually married to someone in the Navy. She was Navy and she was married to someone in the Navy. Um, the level of education among the female veterans ranged from high school to graduate degree. And four of the five um, armed forces was represented in the study. So that was excellent. As I said earlier, Army is our biggest branch. So I wasn't surprised that majority came from the Army, Army with 10, Navy with two, Marines one, and um, one Air Force. And I, I didn't have anyone from the, the Coast Guard. And you can also see some of the other demographics and um, some of the some of the um, that should be bad conduct. Some of the um, you know the original thoughts around when we were starting the the process was you know maybe there's a potential that they had a, a lot of um, you know Article 15s or a lot of things went wrong in their careers. But as you can see by the types of discharge. And the, the limited Article 15 is that that really wasn't the case. So here is the, um, the flyer. And um, as we created the flyer, we really took a lot of thought in how we would do it. And so we selected an African-American female for the flyer because at that time, um, although there was a large increase in women, a part of that increase in uh, homeless female veterans was uh, minority women. So that was one of the reasons why we selected an African-American female um, for the flyer. And as I said, it went out on uh, social media. It also went out on a local, uh, it's Montgomery County, it's in Maryland, listserv. And uh, so I thought that I would receive more people from this area. However, I, I went to Georgia many times for the interviews. Also for their time and um, participation, we had an incentive of $25 per interview. So they received for both interviews uh, $50. I also asked the female veterans to give the flyer to others if they knew of um, others that would be interested in the study and they did. So many would call me and say, I know someone that was in your study, they shared the flyer and I would like to be a part of the, you know, of your study as well. So in this figure, um, it really explains the theoretical framework for the study, uh, life course theory created by Dr. Glenn Elder. And I actually, had someone to create the um, create this for me because I was trying to figure out how to make a model to share everything that was going on and also include the life course theory. So it has the elements of life course perspective, um, the theory that was used as a framework and a foundation for the study as we came up with the questions as we thought through the process, having this theory in the back of my mind really drove how we went about uh, doing the study. So the gray boxes uh, represent the five principles of life course perspective. Those uh, principles are human development and aging as a lifelong process. Uh, you have your linked lives, timing in lives, lives in times and places, and human agency in constrained situations. The colors, the star with the colors represents the phases of the life course experience explored with the participants. So um, you could see the early childhood and adolescence and adulthood, and all of this kind of pulls from that original research question. And then also you have the other components, key components of life course theory, um, which uh, along each triangle 
Let me actually use the laser pointer. It might be a little helpful. Along each triangle, uh, you can kind of see a dotted line. So those dotted lines represent transitions. So the different life events. And then there's some purple lines, the trajectories that are coming off. And for trajectories, um, those are the long-term paths in life. So we wanted to kind of show the trajectories from each of these um, points in their lives. And then the light blue circle here, the light blue circles on the tip of each star with the line radi radiating out. You can see that here, the turning points. Um, so, and the turning points are critical life events that lead to lasting change in the life course trajectory. And that came up a lot, uh, the turning points of leaving, transitioning from the military and becoming a veteran. Also turning points in the military experience. Um, you'll see different verbatim quotes, but the military sexual trauma or the combat related trauma that they experienced, those were critical turning points in their lives that we needed to capture. So essentially all of this together, um, the life course perspective can be used to understand how things like time, age, relationships, history, culture, even life choices um, and your societal context, how that can be used to explain their pathways into homelessness for the female veterans. And um, just for another example, as far as the um, the timing, you know, some of the women were born, I, I had a, a large range, so they were not uh, OEF or um, OEF, OIF veterans. So they were in a, a whole different um, conflict or a whole different operation. And it was because of when they were born. So being able to pick up on these different things is really important because the younger veterans talk more about their combat, direct combat experience, um, while the other veterans didn't talk about that as much. So those, those points were really critical to, to gather and uh, to think about. And I wanted to show the, the service member in uniform, but also out of uniform, because it is the same person, but all of these things are going on. And that transition from, um, from military status to veteran status is, is definitely a difficult one and a challenging one because you you leave so much behind when you're in a uniform. It's, um, it's like a, a way of life. There's a culture in the military. There's camaraderie. You're never alone. You always have a battle buddy. You, there's always there. There's always someone there and there's a great deal of structure. And then leaving that and going to a veteran status, well, all of that is gone. And so, but you'll hear more about that as I get into the, um, the different themes. So with that, it's a great segue because six major themes emerged in answer to that research question. Traumatic experiences across the lifespan. And I broke that out into three different types. Adverse childhood, adverse childhood experiences, because that came up a great deal in the original literature and it came out in the stories as well. Military sexual trauma, and combat related trauma. So I broke those out under those three categories. Entering into the military to escape circumstances, which was, um, I didn't see a great deal about that in the literature. I'm seeing more about that now, the reason why people go into the military. And when you're escaping a really bad situation and you're turning to the military to, to solve that um, bad situation, sometimes it, I think it, it didn't work out as um, as some would have hoped. And we we were trying to come up with an analogy for this. And it was like coming into the military with a, as a glass that already has some cracks in it. And then the pressure from the military and things that can occur um, during your time in the military, applying pressure to the to that already cracked glass. And then eventually it just it breaks and it falls to pieces. Uh, racism, which was um, not heavily seen in the literature. I mentioned earlier um, in 1948, when Truman signed that executive order, um, the military became really the model for race relations. And so 
but now you're hearing you're hearing much more about racism and discrimination and um, unfortunately the events during uh, 2020 uh, with George Floyd brought a lot of that to the surface but it also brought an opportunity for people to discuss this topic and the United States military also took a, a step back and they wanted to review what they were doing as far as racism and discrimination. And so now there's reports being generated and there's conversations being had around this very topic. And gender-related discrimination and sexism, difficulty transitioning from the military, from military status to veteran status, and then um, uh, positive experiences and proud moments in the military. And this one is really important. And I'm, I'm glad that as we went through the data, we captured this theme because what when you when you read uh, many of the research studies from the U.S., you don't see a lot about the proud experiences, um, the positive experiences, and the proud moments. You don't see much of that. But I will say how this was captured was because as we went through reoccurring information, each veteran, despite if they had military sexual trauma or combat related trauma, racism, they also talked about their positive experiences and their proud moments. And they were all very proud of their service. And so sometimes I think we, in, in the US, we don't capture this as much. And um, which when you're talking about homelessness and you're talking about all the other issues that um, the factors that stem from homelessness, it's not necessarily a positive conversation. And so that part of it, um, I think, is lost. But it was important for those women to share that part of their experience as well. So I'm going to now share some of the verbatim quotes. Um, I just want to have uh, to stop and say that some of the material can uh, is, sensitive, is sensitive and it could trigger um, if you have, you know, um, certain reactions or uh, some of the information is, is very detailed. And as I said, it's, it's verbatim. And so uh, if you need to step away or uh, if you need to, um, you know, turn off the audio, that is fine. Please do so because I just want to uh, warn people that the material is, is very sensitive and but it captures the essence of the moment. I didn't change anything in it. So uh, it's, it's very, it's very raw. Um, these, these quotes, um, they talk about despair, um, poverty, being homeless, mental health, substance abuse issues, um, and then, you know, there was even conversations around um, attempted suicide. And even with one of the, the veterans that I met with, I had to uh, reschedule. I had to reschedule because she was hospitalized for a suicide attempt. So uh, these issues are, they're, they're very important. And, it, and, and that's why it's, it's, it needs to be addressed immediately because uh, the longer it goes on, the more people that we're losing and the veterans are feeling forgotten and they're suffering in silence. Uh, we'll start with the adverse childhood experiences. So veteran seven recalled the following memory of sexual abuse from her grandfather, and it was quite vivid. She said, yeah, I was two, two or three years old. Oh gosh, I was just a little baby just lying in there, lying in here, in bed. And my brother was beside me. So my brother had seen everything. He, and she's, she's talking about her grandfather, was an alcoholic. So he came in there. So I didn't say anything. I have no idea why. I just didn't say anything, but my brother told. And so she goes on to talk about how her brother sexually abused a sister a few uh, years later. One thing that I didn't mention is as we built out the um, protocol for the study, the IRB required a um, basically like a plan where someone would become a distress protocol is what we called it. And when they would become highly distressed and if they needed to stop the meeting. And this was one of the veterans where I didn't think we would be able to complete um, 
the interviews because she became so emotional and she had to stop multiple times, which um, she always asked to continue with it after she was able to calm down. So, um, but some of them became very upset and really relive the process of sharing, which was also hard for me because I am a clinician, but in that role, I was a researcher. So I wasn't there to provide therapeutic services. I was there to be a researcher. So it was, that was hard. Military sexual trauma, just an example from that. And this, this example is um, not what you would typically think about when you're talking about military sexual trauma. Veteran 5 stated, and one stood at the door and the other one, we got into a yelling match. And all I knew was she tackled me. I was on the floor and she was kicking me and beating me. I fractured some ribs and I was lucky if I had not have covered my face, I think they would have kicked my eyes off. And they pulled my pants down and one of them started and then she started crying, stuffing in my, my vagina. I don't know what, I think it was probably a finger. And then she heard, quick, quick, get her up, get her pants on. And so someone had, had heard me screaming and I was too out of it. They had to carry me on the stretcher to the medic, to the sick bay on the base. And she just continued after she told that story, she just said how she was um, encouraged not to report it. And then she also talked about how her career just went downward from there, that she was a stellar um, service member up until that point and you know, taking on leadership. But after that, she just felt pretty much worthless and things just went down from there for her. Veteran Nine stated, to get in the military, I had to take care of his, and she's referring to her recruiter, needs. He basically sexually assaulted me and I was just scared because that was the last thing, that was her last option for changing the direction of her life. She was trying to escape some circumstances and she said, I don't know what else I will be able to do. So her recruiter actually took advantage of the situation and she was able to enter the military. However, the, um, the sexual assault continued to basically follow her throughout her career. Uh, Veteran 11 stated, for the second time, the sexual harassment and assault was severe. Both of them were very severe. The first time I was just very naive in the scouts marriage. So we know we feel bad about it, guilty about that. And she's referring to she's guilty about the sexual harassment and assault because he has four kids. So there's also, um, you know, issues where they're talking about the assault, but also doing a lot of self-blame around it and um, a lot of guilt. Veteran, stated, veteran 14 stated, so when I was in the military, I had to literally fight off my lead petty officer. Then there was another gentleman. This was so it was so, it was really bad. This was so horrific. I can't even remember his name. I just remember fighting and screaming and yelling and fighting. And that's exactly, as I said, these are verbatim quotes. So this is exactly how they're saying it. And some of them have more detail than others. It is, it's almost like a blur. They just have bits and pieces of it. Uh, another example of military sexual trauma, um, veteran six, before we went to my new apartment, he stopped at a liquor store and bought him a pint of liquor. And while I was putting my kids down to go to sleep, he started drinking his liquor. I came out to the couch on the couch and I'm tired because I was jet lagged. I was woken up by him having his hands in my underwear filling me up. So naturally I went into a state of panic and fear. And she was also one of the veterans that talked about um, how she just continued to find herself in really bad situations that uh, escalated, that eventually her, her time of service ended. Uh, entering into another theme, entering into the military to escape circumstances. Veteran I recall, yes, first DUI, then after the first DUI, I just kind of started going downhill. I had a lot of legal issues. I found out my first love, who is the girl I dated, and my stepfather, who was the only person I looked at like a father, had a sexual encounter. They actually had sex. That broke my heart. I lost my apartment. Then I went to my mommy's house. Stuff happened in there. At 23, I got to go. I got to get into the military. That's when I go in. And that's the same veteran who also talked about her recruiter taking advantage of her. But um, And she was scared about the DUI and that 
they would find out and she wouldn't get in. So she uh, felt she had to do things to make that happen. Another thing, racism during military service. I think I only provided one example of this, but Veteran stated that racism was a central part of her military experience. First, they talk about Muhammad Ali like, oh yeah, black people ain't really here for the military or whatever. Look at Muhammad Ali, he was a coward. But what's the difference between a park bench and a black man? Oh, well, a park bench supports his family. And then she said, all the time, all the time. And they have a dozen of them. I got black people in my family tree too, you know, they're hanging in the back. And so she was just saying all of these, she was just saying all of these um, jokes that she remembered clearly. Um, and she would just share them and I captured that portion of it. Another theme, gender related discrimination and sexism. Um, veteran eight stated, so pretty much most of the females stuck together. So we had to stick up for each other because a lot of times the guys will look down upon us. I remember being in Iraq and we had to fight to get our, our own. They, just talking about the men in the chorus, didn't want any females in their class. And I remember my partner being 6'5 and 225 pounds dropping me on the dirt in the ground. And then she talked about how she had bruises all over her body because uh, when they would do different um, whatever events or, or whatever they were having that she felt that she was treated rougher because they just didn't want her to be there. And then difficulty transitioning from military status to veteran status. Um, veteran four recalled her transition experiences as appalling. It was just terrible. I cried the first time I cried all the time. I don't know what to do with myself. I didn't know. I had, I had never been on an interview or anything like that because the jobs that I had before I joined the military were all like telemarketing jobs. We had not done interviews, just had to go up there and then you were hired. I think I bombed, I bombed, just totally bombed out of life for this first six months. And this is a good example of having that structure in the military, being placed in your positions and then coming out and actually having to compete um, like a regular civilian, make a CV, do the interview. But if you, if you, um, been placed in your positions and you've had that structure around you to take care of your career, it's hard when you have to face the reality of doing it on your own. And that covers all of the themes. The homeless experience, um, just wanted to share a couple of quotes from that. Um, and Veteran 8 is talking about being homeless with the infant and she says, oh my God, I think that was the most pivotal moment in my life. I went to, she said she was begging and asking people everywhere, I said, I'm going to go to the VA hospital. VA hospital was making me cry because they made, and she stops and she says, I'm depressed over here. Nobody is helping me. And then she starts to tell me about her first shelter. And she said they had bed bugs. My daughter got bit up so bad. I cried every day that my daughter got bit up with the bed bugs. I actually saw them. People had babies. The babies were screaming and crying. And sometimes some of the food in the shelter was kind of like molded and old and we couldn't even eat it, you know? Um, so there's also uh, many veterans that you talk to, I'm not sure if it's the same in uh, Canada, sometimes they have strong issues with the VA and many um, prefer not to go to the VA. So there's always that, that um, the VA and, you know, stakeholders are working with veterans, so they're connected and receiving the benefits that they need, but sometimes they don't feel that connection with the VA, which is unfortunate, um, being that the VA, the VA has so many resources that they need to um, utilize, so that there's a challenge there, and they have anger and resentment, um, which, you know, across the, the different things that I've shared and other reasons where you could probably kind of figure out why, but um, it, it creates a barrier to accessing service services. And as far as the homeless experience, I mean, it was a, a, the amount, the time in homelessness, it, it differed, uh, shelter versus unsheltered. But what was core to this experience was a feeling of being isolated and a feeling of being forgotten by the country and, um, and just feeling like they were in that, in that situation alone and that they had served, they gave everything they had, but 
um, just didn't receive back when they came home. And some of the veterans even mentioned, especially the older female veterans mentioned that they didn't even know that they were considered a veteran at that time. And it kind of goes back to me earlier when I said as a, a naive social worker, I thought that I would only work with men. And that was, it was kind of the, um, I don't want to say the thought process, but that was the messaging to some degree, I think, for many women that, you know, I'm not a veteran. I, you know, I didn't do a combat role. Um, and so some of these veterans were very delayed in accessing their services. Um, also, I want to say that none of these factors, um, I'm not trying to say that none of these factors caused them to be homeless, but I do think um, that they played a role in that pathway into homelessness. I think it's important to, to look at it. There's so many, many factors from, um, the, and we talked about some of those risk factors earlier, but there's so many other factors that play a major role in all of this. But I think it's important to, as we look at these pathways and we try to determine what is really leading our veterans to, uh, to homelessness. So a solution, um, housing first. Housing first, uh, it pri it's a priority of housing the person first. Um, it inspires hope. One of the articles that was in the uh, required readings was about, um, it was about general homelessness, but it talked a lot about hope. And that is what you find with the housing first model. It Housing first helps to, be, to meet a basic human need before, we start to think about all the other parts and the services that are needed. The person is homeless and then they're housed. And then you plug in your medical, your mental, your income and all of that leading to that life stability. And um, for me, I'm lucky in that I, I saw it play out how it should. I saw veterans come in with their head hanging down, you know, living on the streets for years, dirty, no job. And they come in and they say, I heard about this program. What are you able to do to help me? And then helping them that, you know, and they take this on on themselves as well. It's not like you have to do it for them. You say, well, you have to look for a place. I'll help you. Um, and they find their own place. You work out the whole process with HUD. They get a voucher. They get their lease. And then I started to connect them to the services that they needed, the mental health, the substance abuse services, getting them employed. And I remember being at my desk one day and a veteran coming in and I didn't know who he was because he had been housed for a while. So I wasn't going out to see him as much. I was seeing him like once a month, I would go by, check on him, make sure he was okay. And he came in and he just wanted to say hello. He was, you know, he went to work and he was dressed really nice. And it was, it was like night and day. So when this program, when Housing First and the, the HUD Bash program, when it really comes together, it, I mean, it's amazing to see how the veterans can transition from being homeless to being stably housed, to being well on their way of not needing any support from anyone. Um, the other thing about Housing First uh, is that in, in the past, we tried a lot of models and the focus always was, well, they have, you know, mental health issues or they have substance abuse issues. So they have to complete, they have to complete a substance abuse program before we can house them because they may, you know, maybe they might start using drugs again. It was always like a carrot. The housing was the carrot. In order to get the carrot, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And we lost a lot of people with that. But with the housing first model, people are like, you know, being housed, just being in this apartment in itself, it has done wonders for my mental health. Being in this house itself makes me want to go out and get a job. And so when you read many of those articles, you'll see, um, you'll see a lot of that where people are saying how it just, being in the house itself changed their mindset and, and it helped them get on the right path. Now, the, another one of the optional readings was a, um, a study, and I pointed this one out because it was saying that homeless are very different than in the U.S. And one of the main issues was um, that Canadians are really proud of their um, of their service, and and that goes to our research not highlighting that when we're talking about all of the bad things, we don't necessarily highlight that how proud our veterans are because. 
um, just on, 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 on Veterans Day, you can pretty much go anywhere and see veterans with their hats on. Um, despite what happened, they're very proud of that service. And, and so I think we've we've covered that in reporting the numbers and reporting all of the, the negative things that we haven't shown that our veterans are absolutely proud of their service as well. And there were so many good moments, although bad as well. Um, I read something, I, I can't remember, I was reading so many different articles, but it, it, one person basically said, well, the United States was able to cut their numbers drastically. Of course, they're not you know, done, but they said we have 3,000 to 5,000. So we know we can eliminate that because the U.S. has eliminated a, a bigger portion than that, you know, starting with a, a bigger number, of course. And I, um, I fully agree with that. I think there can be efforts and it takes more than just the, the local VA or um, you know, it, it takes a whole community to address these issues and you have to have the wraparound services and you have to have veterans as a part of that because they know that story and they, as peers, they are very influential over others. So coming together and coming up with a solution, I think is definitely possible when you have numbers like 3,000 to 5,000. Of course, you're going to have those complex cases where it's not just as easy as I house them. I link that person to mental health and substance abuse. And now, you know, the magic is going to happen. You're going to have those, um, you know, those repeat offenders, but you have to really nail it down to figure out how can I keep this person wrapped in services. So once they're housed, they don't leave the housing or do something to jeopardize the housing because we, we saw that. Um, I wanted to show, and you know, just to wrap up, some of my homeless veteran service. Um, when I'm not in the uniform and I can find some downtime, I am out in the community serving. This is uh, Walking Their Shoes with the DC Veteran Affairs. Uh, you can see me here, some of my PHS fellow officers, and we had collected brand new boots for um, homeless veterans. And uh, every year, it's called Winter Haven, every January, after the pit count that was mentioned in the video where they go looking for to count the number of homeless individuals to include veterans, um, the DCBA puts on the walk in, their, walk in their shoes. They give out boots, they give out a hot meal, coats and things like that. So these are just some photos. It takes so many community, there's community partners, there's military, there's public health service. Um, working together just to make sure that the veterans have what they need to see the socks, other officers, and this, at this point, many of the boxes are gone, but the whole room is literally filled with boxes and they're like in back rooms and they keep bringing them in as well. Um, this is a picture from US Vets. US Vets, um, the director was actually in the video as well. So they have locations all over the country and we partner with them to support their homeless vets. And here we're having a cookout for them. It was just to honor them on Labor Day. And people just came out, community came out, donations. We had so much food that they ate and then they had enough for the next day. They probably had to throw away some stuff because it was more food than we uh, thought we would have. And so you can see the PHS officers and just um, volunteers wanting to be there to serve. And I'm sure you have the same in your communities as well. This is last uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, and we're at our local Sam's Club getting all of the turkey, buying literally all of the turkeys so we could take, so they could give out to actually uh, families that had recently found homes. They had recently transitioned from being in a shelter and they wanted to cook um, a Thanksgiving meal. And so we helped to raise things and others bought stuff as well. So they were able to feed like over a hundred families. And I will stop there for in the slideshow and, um, and take questions. I know that was a lot to cover. Let's stop share here. Thank you so much, Dr. Felder. That was an amazing presentation. So moving and so touching. I will, uh, I will uh, let the chat room open, uh, and I will stop the recording uh, just to uh, to allow people to uh, speak up if they wish. Just one sec. I'm doing that right now. <laughs> and stop recording, there we go.